Thank you for joining us today. Hello and welcome to the Senate Committee on Energy, Economic Development and Tourism, 101 p.m. agenda. This meeting is being streamed live today on YouTube. In the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, February 13th in this room, 229, and a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. Please note we have a one minute uh, per test of our, um, and if you forget that the February 14th is Valentine's Day, don't forget your honey. Uh, first measure up, Senate Bill 3194, and your committee members. Uh, relating to energy, DCCA, Michelangelo. Thank you. Next up, uh, PUC, Leo Asuncion. My name is Grace Ralph, PUC. We stand on our written testimony. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, next up, Micah Munekata for Ulupono Initiative. Uh, with comments, Jody Robinson for Blue Planet Foundation in support. Uh, Rocky Mould in support. Uh, in opposition, David Bissell with KIUC. With comments, testifying for Hawaiian Electric is James Abraham. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is James Abraham. I'm testifying on behalf of Hawaiian Electric, providing comments on Senate Bill 3194. Hawaiian Electric has strong concerns with imposing a mainland retail wheeling model on our isolated island grids without properly evaluating and balancing key considerations and impacts to our customers. As provided in our written testimony, Hawaiian Electric agrees with the PUC opening an investigatory docket to examine the many issues with applying wheeling to Hawaii. Specifically, we, were, we support the PUC taking a look at intergovernmental wheeling, that's wheeling between governmental agencies as a first step because it would help limit the risks and impacts. This bill, however, uh, concerns full retail wheeling by private parties, which we believe comes with greater risk. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Sandy Wong with Tahiri Power LLC and so forth. Good morning, Chair DeCoy and members of the committee. And Chair DeCoit, I will remember you and the committee on Valentine's Day. <laughs> You're all my honeys. <laughs> um, so I'm Sandy Wong, and I'm here on behalf of Tahiri Power. Uh, we are in strong support of this bill. Uh, Tahiri Power is a wind power. It's a, a, a wind energy farm. Uh, we are an independent power producer, and we do sell our power to HECO. Now, under our power purchase agreement with HECO, or HELCO, uh, we are only able to sell our energy to HELCO or use the energy on our site. So if there is excess energy or if HELCO curtails us and there's excess energy, um, that re clean, renewable energy goes to waste. And so we would like to explore wheeling because if you explore it, you know, it's like a lot of times people will go, it's only the rich guys, you know, but actually you can, you can wheel it to the state, you can wheel it to the county, you can wheel it to affordable housing. So really the PUC should look at that so that it is fair for all. So I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Dylan Armstrong in support. Stanley Osterman also in support. Anybody else in the room wishing to testify on this measure? See none. Any questions for the committee? Anybody from the PC? Yep. Uh, Grace. Yes. Yeah. Grace Ralph. Senator King. So, have the PC looked into this, or are they intending to look into this? Can you give us some background? <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so the PUC has looked into this. We had a docket previously about, I think, 15 years ago that looked into this. Um, as our testimony mentions, it's a very complex issue. And as time elapsed in that docket, um, you know, it became clear that there were other venues where we could look at these issues as well. 
So that docket is now closed, but we are looking at many related issues across various proceedings at the PUC right now. We have a distributed energy resource docket um, that looks to that provides you know compensation for customer generators. We also have um, a microgrid docket that looks at more distribution level wheeling, and then we are also looking at um, what's called a green tariff for the University of Hawaii, which um, is very similar to wheeling, but more of sort of a, yeah a financial mechanism for them specifically. So according to what this bill calls for, no later than December thirty first, twenty twenty four, Public Utility Commission shall establish by no order policy and procedures to implement retail wheeling. Way to charge. Is that something that you folks are already undertaking, or you need a law, or you need this in order to, to do that? I don't think we necessarily need a law in order to do that. We are looking are at. No. Sorry. Will you do it without a law? Um, we absolutely can. Yeah. Yeah, can and will you do it? It's two different things. So, will you folks be doing this? I would want to chat with you know. The rest of my colleagues at the PUC and um, you know figure out what timeline makes sense and what the the real objectives of this wheeling uh, like what a wheeling investigation would look at I think full retail wheeling has many complexities um, and as some of the other testifiers have mentioned you know maybe it might be better to look at intergovernmental wheeling to start so that's more beneficial I think on face value whereas full retail wheeling could have equity implications and challenges in terms of, um, you know, clogging up the transmission and distribution systems and challenges to renewable resource planning and those kinds of things. But that's exactly why you folks are there, because you're the you're more in a position to be able to do this investigation, not us. So um, have people come to the, to the PUC requesting this information, requesting this investigation take place not in my awareness of my time at the PUC How we did have been there in there about four years now so um, nobody's asked for you folks to look at wheeling well I mean, we've seen these bills before in the past um so you know that definitely is something that we have been asked to do um but you haven't done it again I would say we have looked at retail wheel or wheeling in certain limited contexts um, like the UH Manoa is an example of wheeling. If you all want us to look at wheeling, I think we would be happy to open an investigator docket and do so. Okay, but again, we have the PUC for a purpose. And if you see these bills come forward all these years, then obviously there's concern. So wouldn't you folks want to take it up? Because I don't hate to be doing your job because I don't want you doing our job. So we, you know, we need to, for you folks to be proactive and then the bills don't come to us because we're not the yeah. experts in this area. Yep. Yeah, I absolutely hear that. I do think that some of the objectives of the bill are being met and explored in other areas. Um, and, you know, as I'm mentioning, this is wheeling has some complexities and challenges. And so I think we've tried to address some of the objectives of wheeling with other proceedings that are going on. Okay, so can you folks provide us with that information? Sure thing. Yes. Senator Wakai. Can stay there. Yeah. Uh, Senator Kim brings up a lot of good points. I mean, I've introduced this bill for three years. Um, so you could have opened up the docket many years ago. And the fact that you're saying it can be done, but you really haven't done it. I mean, at a certain point, like, we got to, like, cut bait and we're going to mandate that you do something with this rather than just come here year after year saying we might, we could, we, sh we, we don't. Ultimately, you don't. I mean, how many bills has the PUC introduced regarding we? How many have we introduced? I, I'm not sure about that. I would have to get back to you on that. Right. So that's where our responsibility is to, you know, from a policy standpoint, set the tone as and some level of direction mm -hmm. as to where the PUC goes. Because in this particular area, the PUC is not leading us in any way down uh, the idea of, of wheeling. Mm -hmm. Speaking about the, the future just of Hawaiian Electric, and you know, who knows how all of the the awards from all of the lawsuits are going to come out and and the, if the Hawaiian electric of today is going to look anything like the Hawaiian electric of, of the future, shouldn't we be preparing for microgrids um, and having resiliency if the, you know, the mothership, so to speak, cannot provide all of us the electricity we need, we need to have microgrids and microgrids are going to be dependent upon wheeling if the if the mothership 
become smaller or implodes. Absolutely. I could not agree more that resilience is absolutely critical. And I think, you know, the events of this past year have only underscored that. The Commission has um, undertaken phase one of our microgrid, microgrid proceeding and developed a microgrid tariff, which I think you could consider as distribution level wheeling. And um, we're moving into phase two of that to look at um, some of the implementation details to really get those off the ground. Right. But all of that is key on the ability for us to wheel energy. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Hoyne Electric, please. What, what, is, what is your guys' challenges with wheeling? I mean, I know you guys resist the fact that wheeling can impact others um, of users. What, what are those challenges of impacts? Sure, and I, I think we do lay out some of them in our written testimony. A, a big one is, uh, of course, we have the 100% renewable uh, law by 2045. So with the land constraints we have and on the islands, particularly Oahu, we're really gonna need all of the land that's viable for renewable energy to help meet that goal. And one issue we have with wheeling is some of the best, uh, most viable areas for renewable projects could be taken for the benefit of just one off taker as opposed to it uh, going to benefit all customers. So are, are, are you trying to say that even if we looked at wheeling in general, that a user that doesn't have the opportunity to have energy wheeled to them will be impacted? Is that what you're telling me? Well, I think the concern would again, come with how it is implemented. Wheeling, this full retail wheeling model is one that's really taken from the mainland where they have interconnected grids, you know, a bulk power transmission system. It's very different from our isolated island grids that we have. It's very different how we manage the, the electric grids. Um, so I think the impacts are very different from what you see on the mainland. That's why we, we do support, you know, the PUC taking a look at you know, how those impacts, you know, how to minimize impacts, how to make it work, you know, for the benefit of everyone. I guess because I think we just heard from the PUC that after all these years of bills being introduced by wheeling, you know, they have not come up with something in regards to a wheeling program. Um, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Follow up. Uh, Senator Kim. So have you folks, have people asked PUC to look into it? Uh, we haven't asked them to look into full retail wheeling. Again, we have a lot of concerns with this full retail wheeling mainland model. We have done, instituted many programs that have the benefits of wheeling. For instance, our shared solar program uh, allows you know, folks who are maybe in an apartment or condo building to effectively you know, utilize energy produced at a solar farm you know, somewhere else on the island. So that kind of, you know, it has the concepts of wheeling. I think the PUC also spoke about the green tariff that we've worked on, which is specific to University of Hawaii and the microgrid docket. So there are, you know, certain programs in like isolated fashion. Right, that, but that concern. the bills that have been introduced, you know, it's going to keep coming up. And if you feel it's going to keep ignoring it and you keep saying that, you know, don't you want to know and get the facts so that you can come to us and say, look, it doesn't work or whatever. It, I mean. So yeah. you need to, you folks need to be proactive as well. Yeah, and I think we have taken, you know, when we see an opportunity for these types of concepts to work within our isolated grids, we have helped develop those programs with the PUC's input. Okay, thank you. So, 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 so if PUC did come back and, you know, they put everything together and say, you know, wheeling is, works well, uh, we recommend wheeling within intergovernmental and those within the transmission. Would you guys execute? Yes, uh, of course. If the PUC okay. orders us to, we would we okay. definitely follow the PUC. Thank orders. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? Seeing none. Uh, next up on the agenda, agenda, Senate Bill 3043, relating to Small Business Regulatory Review Board. <clears throat> First up, uh, DBID Director Dane Licker. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Dean Wicker, Deputy Director of DBED. We stand on our testimony in support of this admin bill. And I do have our administrator, Dori Pakovich, from the Small Business Regulatory Review Board, here for questions, um, if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, next up, Mary Al Albit, uh, Small Business Regulatory Review Board on Zoom. Not present on Zoom, Chair. Okay. Anybody else uh, in the room wishing to testify on this measure? Seeing none, any questions from the committee? Okay, moving on to... Actually, I have a question for DBED, sorry. Um, so, so, Dean, how practical is it for the board to review legislation given that bills may change at a rapid pace during the legislative session? Probably Dory and um, defer details, but this gives us another vehicle for us to explain and discuss legislation with the businesses that contact the regulatory review board office. Yes, this bill came about because last year at the end of the legislative session, a group of small businesses approached the board, wanted them to um, send a letter to the governor asking that this particular bill be vetoed. Our deputy AG said, no, we couldn't do that. So we said, well, how can we provide testimony? So she is the one that provided the wording for this statute. Okay, okay thank house, you. Kind of a house cleaning clarification. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, next up. Uh, Senate Bill 3010 relating to renewable energy. Uh, first testifier, State Energy Office. Um, Mark Glick here. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Chief, Chief Energy Officer um, for the Hawaii State Energy Office. Um, Chair DeCoy, Chair Wakai, members of the committee. Uh, we stand on our testimony uh, with comments on Senate Bill uh, 3010. Thank you. Uh, next up, PUC. Le, le, oh, Grace. Thank you. Uh, next up, testifying for Hawaii Gas in support. Stanley Olserman also in support, and Dylan Armstrong in support. Anybody else wishing to testify on this measure? All right. All questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none. Um, Next up, Senate Bill 3282, relating to energy. Uh, first up, Hawaii uh, State Energy Office, Mark Glick on Zoom. Thank you, um, Chair DeCoy, uh, Vice Chair Wakai, members of the committee, uh, the, Mark Glick for the Hawaii State Energy Office. Um, we stand on our testimony uh, with comments on Senate Bill uh, 3282. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Next up, Stanley Osterman testifying for Tiger Shark LLC in support. Uh, Dylan Inch Armstrong in support and Brian Barbada in support. Um, anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? Seeing none, any questions for the committee? Uh, I, I have, uh, so sorry. Mark, are, are you still there? Mark. I, I am still here. So, so um, Mark, would this change in your organization pose any problems in carrying out your current functions and will the change strengthen the current energy office? Well, we view it as a distraction from our current duties because we work directly with the governor very effectively on uh, grants and the entire agenda, uh, and we're able to focus, I think, more thoroughly uh, on the energy agenda. So if it were um, sort of returned to the DBED front, we work very closely with DBED, but we believe that there are a lot of extremely important business and economic development issues at DBED, and it allows us to really focus on the energy matter uh, directly with the support of the governor and DBED in its current form. So, so can you elaborate um, on the state energy's plan to achieve 100% uh, uh, clean energy by 2045? Yeah, absolutely. We have flagged and identified <laughs> uh, the key areas that we see uh, that are not fully covered by under the integrated grid plan and other uh, planning efforts. Um, we want to invest more in um, geothermal 
Energy, for example, and the governor's made funds available for slim hole drilling. Uh, we're, we've also asked the legislature for additional support for that. We see that as a, an important piece uh, to manage the firm energy, the renewable energy element uh, that has been uh, somewhat ignored uh, in the past number of years. We also uh, have been working very vigorously uh, to reduce the costs to the energy system by looking at uh, fuels other than diesel and uh, low sulfur fuel oil, which again, uh, are not really addressed under the current plans for replacement and which we believe uh, have added unnecessarily to uh, oil price volatility. And so we are currently analyzing, with, again, with the governor's support and funding uh, to do uh, that critical research by the end of this quarter, we'll have uh, fully investigated that and we'll come back and, and provide a report uh, on whether such a plan is viable and how that should proceed. And we believe that could potentially create significant savings and carbon reductions in the energy plan. And again, that's not currently anticipated uh, by any of the current plans. So, so Mark, I guess what I try to figure out is as we went around and we did our site visits, um, you know, we tried to isolate what was those benchmarks. In other words, uh, 2025, 2030, 2035, leading up to 2045. And as we saw the different percentages and um, biodiversity that we were looking at in um, different renewables or energy in general, um, relating to the blackouts we've been having, not just here, but in the big island. I, I wanted to know how is the office actually doing implementation? I, I think a lot of us have been waiting on what is the implementation um, going forward uh, within, the, within the office. Yeah, so um, that's a very good question. Uh, and what we've been doing vigorously over the last um, 12 months uh, since uh, this administration began and since I became uh, chief energy officer has been to, as I point out, first identify the appropriate plans and pathways. We also did that with the decarbonation, decarbonization strategy. And we're now putting funds uh, towards actual drilling efforts uh, to be able to fill some of those gaps in the firm renewable agenda. We hope to propose a, uh, a set of recommendations that would lead to uh, actions. Again, it's premature for me to issue or at least make a statement on what we uh, what we plan to announce or uh, describe in early April, uh, but those plans are underway that, uh, that would look at alternative fuels uh, to the current fuel system that would actually uh, reduce costs and we believe would add more enhanced supply for form firm generation, which again has been lacking and I think uh, is, is uh, perhaps has exacerbated some of these issues in terms of uh, rolling brownouts and so on. Um, we also are exploring in that same plan um, ways to enhance uh, the power generation system uh, with investments and again with fuel switching, which we think will be extremely important. And all of those are new endeavors that have taken place over the last six to eight months that we're fully investigating. So. If, I think there's been a lot of activity. Um, a lot of it hasn't been um, fully announced yet, but uh, certainly underway, and and I think we're making progress. So, so do you have any mechanism in place to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of the state energy plan in achieving the goals and objectives that you've just mentioned? Uh, y yes, Senator Decoit, I I believe that. Um, each of the, um, you know, in, in the case of uh, the slim hole drilling, uh, you know, the, the first step was to secure funding, which we have done. So I think we'll be able to report, um, you know, report on uh, the flow of funds that will lead to drilling. Uh, we'll be able to report to the contracts under which 
um, that drilling will take place. Again, that's a research activity to understand uh, water temperature and, uh, and also water availability uh, where geothermal may be present. Uh, initially uh, on the island of Maui, and of course, if we are able to get additional funding uh, on other islands. So, um, the, you know, the metrics there will be um, initially the funding. And then uh, the second um, element of that is the actual uh, test wells. And then after that period, uh, after uh, roughly 12 to 14 months, the actual reports on the um, on the resource characterization, you know, the water heat, and uh, and so we'll be able to report on that element as well. I would say that on all of these efforts, in, including the um, the measures that have to do with um, different investments on the power generation system, as well as some of the fuel switching, they all have associated with them uh, stepwise functions and activities. Um, if it moves forward, and we'll be able to present that and uh, account for that over time. Okay, thank you. Any, any questions? Um, I have a question for Tibet. So, th thank you. So, how will the integration enhance coordination and collaboration between energy initiatives and the economic development strategies that you folks have set? So actually in statute, <clears throat> energy development management falls under DFED. It's in chapter 26. And if we were to take in a division, um, it's already been done a year ago. Um, it's the policy called the legislature. We would implement that. We did it with ADC. We did it with stadium authority. Um, <clears throat> but I look at it two different ways. If um, a lot of discussion has been, what's the plan? And what's implementation? Um, divisions. DBED director's office is able to work with quicker in developing a plan as those divisions report directly to the director. Attached agencies report to a board and a board of directors, so it takes time to get a strategic plan in place. You have to have a further discussion in, um, on a board agenda. Um, if there's an interim ED in place, that takes time. Um, if there's an interim ED in place, you won't get a strategic plan immediately. Uh, if the decision is to go with a division, we would coordinate with the uh, with the administrator. Um, the fact is that with this attached agency, there is no board. So with the boards of our other attached agencies, DBID is an ex-official voting member. And so we get a seat at the table to discuss policy, um, discuss budget that aligns with the director's plan. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, moving on to Senate Bill 3364, Relating to destination management. Uh, first person up, Daniel Hopi for HTA. Daniel Hopi, Interim President CEO of the Hawaii Tourism Authority. Aloha Chair Decoy and Vice Chair Wakai, and members Senator Fukunaga and Senator Wakarukin. The Hawaii Tourism Authority has submitted its testimony in support of the bill, and we go back to recognize that back in 2006, the legislator, a legislation, sorry, legislature, um, authorized and funded a study from DBED that looked at sustainable tourism. And from that point, we have been working towards what we call destination management, how future tourism growth can be better managed, not only looking at numbers and limits, but really balancing resident and tourist welfare cultural, environmental, and economic interests, at the same time maintaining the quality of the tourism product and a sense of place. HTA is poised and eager to continue our work in destination management, and we have submitted in our departmental budget request positions for destination managers, support service, as well as quality assurance and contract management to support destination management. Mahalo for the opportunity to provide these comments, and we're here to answer any other questions going forward. Thank you. Uh, next up, Lisa Paulson for Maui uh, Hotel and Lodging Association in support. Kona Kohala Chamber of Commerce in support. Lahaina Town Action Committee in support. Uh, Council for Native Foreign Advancement in support. Hawaii Civic Clubs, Maui Chamber of Commerce. Um, Movie Hanaman, Hawaii Lodging and Tourism in support. Uh, 
Kili Alperdi in opposition, and Stephanie Iona in support. Anybody else wishing to testify on this measure? Seeing none, any questions from the members? Senator King. I have a question. So the contracts that was let, um, one was for destination management, correct? Uh, are you referring to the contract with um, Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement yes. that was awarded last year? Yes. So the Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement contract is related to some of the regenerative tourism actions and programs that we're looking at, including funding of community programs, quality assurance, technical assistance and training to move towards a more regenerative tourism product. The so main destination. destination management type of work is currently being done through a contract that we have with the Hawaii Visitors and Convention Bureau. We contract full-time on-island destination managers and our staff manages those destination managers to implement our DMAP program, uh, programs that we had done in planning about three years ago. And that contract amount is? Uh, I have to get back to you for the total amount. It's been for three years now. Uh, and the contract ends at uh, final is August of 2024. So this August? Yes. So we manage the managers? Yes. They have uh, weekly meetings. And uh, so they're contracted full time. And our um, destination stewardship officer, Kalanika Anana, manage them manages them currently. How many managers, destination managers, do you have? Currently, we have four uh, contracted out managers as well as our staff itself also work in destination management. Okay, and how many do you have at HTA? So we have filled positions. We have two filled destination brand managers and a support staff. We have two that are unfilled at this time. We're waiting for it to be filled. Okay, I'm just wondering the overlap. I'm wondering the duplication. It's, you know, it's, it seems like government hire consultants or contractors and then the people which, that we hire that's supposed to have these skills and these quali qualifications to do the job don't because we hire the contractors and all they do is oversee the contractors. So I'm trying to find how we can be more efficient because I mean, Correct. we constantly do that. And that's why I think in this new uh, current leadership, we have looked to requesting actual positions that'll be HTA staff to do the destination management. So you're gonna get, once the contract is up in August, you have And no even before, if possible. If once we get um, the positions uh, approved and moved into place and budgeted, we will cancel the contract or complete it out and turn over um, the management to the staff itself. Okay, so can you provide the committee with a comparison between what we're paying for now, the contractor, and what it's gonna cost us when you fully fund it through HTA? Yes, I'll send that table. We have already calculated it. Any other questions? Okay, so I, I get one for you. Sure. Um, you know, we have an opposition on the DMAP coming out of Molokai, and I think we had this conversation about the managers that are out there. Um, my question is, well, I believe Molokai is the only one that has not come up with a destination management plan. Um, I was unaware that some of the meetings that are being held right now is not under HTA destination management plan. So if this group that is doing their own community meetings that we're unaware of, how does that fall into the alignment of them coming back and asking for the priorities that they set when others in the community are unaware of the meeting that the very people that first started it isn't allowing the community to also be there or at least notified to be having a seat at the table. So as you know, it can be very difficult to work in some communities such as uh, the residents of Molokai. And um, we have been working with these uh, task force. Uh, they have done some work on their own. We have been work, told them 
you know, that if they are doing any work, uh, that they have to include the communities. And in fact, they stated that they would include communities and representation, while we continue to do our own, continue to do meetings, including them. So, so Daniel, and, and let, me, let me just like cut to the chase. So there are four meetings held on Molokai. Outside of that manager that's being hired, helping to guide them. So my question is, how do you guide one group that doesn't have somebody to guide them that we're paying for, and yet having community members after the three of us were on Molokai to give reassurance that those that had difficulties understanding what DMAP was when seat on the table and calling me later to ask me, hey, how come you never informed me of a meeting that I never know about? Is, is it your recommendation at this point based on the opposition that we carve Molokai out? Or do Our we, recommendation is do to we proceed, hire that, on, proceed on having an on-island destination manager, which we know we don't have at this time. We've been trying to manage it from this island and from Maui. Uh, we feel as we're making progress, uh, we have talked to a potential destination manager that we feel can work with and facilitate discussion with the various communities. And we will continue to enforce that it is a, what we do and support and fund is part of the destination, destination management action plans that were originally agreed to. And it has to have full representation of the community and community, full community support. So, so the manager that we have that oversight now out of Maui, what kind of ground support is that individual using? Is that individual guiding them now, or is there no communication? Is my question between the ones that's been hired on Maui to help guide the Molokai one that should have actually been able to get information out to attend these meetings that have been held in every district of Molokai. We know the our relationship didn't work so well and it was identified at that Molokai meet community meeting that we had a couple of months ago. So from the, after that meeting, we shifted in-house to our officer. And if I could have Kalani explain the process he's going through right now and managing uh, the Molokai community. Well, Chair, Vice Chair members, Kalani Kalanana, Chief Stewardship Officer, Hawaii Tourism Authority. So the long story short is Megan is in communication with the A2 subcommittee, which is Kiliama. Uh, and so we know that the committee didn't agree with HTA's recommended changes to the brochure that is being considered. The long story short is they wanted to seek additional community input in four meetings across Molokai in different districts. We disagreed with that approach. They asked to proceed on their own, or they proceeded on their own, uh, to have those four meetings with limited, I think, notice, I think is one of the concerns that was raised, as well as participation, and then even some concerns, I think, around facilitation. Uh, in response to that, I've asked Megan, who's our Maui Nui DMAP manager, is to continue to keep in communication with the A2 subcommittee. Uh, and then also my recommendation is that we would hire a temporary Molokai DMAP coordinator and that process has begun. Uh, it would be done through Hawaii Visitors and Convention Bureau through a temp agency. So since Megan has been working with him, why haven't my office been notified of these community meetings that have been limited and the, and the show of it was five people? I, I mean, you're looking at a population of 7,000 people and I've, I've made it clear at the meeting on Molokai when we had the cruise ship and we wanted to make sure that information was disseminated as accurately as possible, half of these guys never knew about this meeting that the one person in opposition basically is opposing this bill right now, which is why I'm asking, do we keep Molokai in there? Because she's been part of this committee and subcommittee. And though we've realized that we had to tend to Lahaina, now is asking that, we, that she oppose this. I think my short recommendation is that we continue to work with Molokai and that Molokai should have its own DMAP as it presently does. If outcomes aren't attainable, I think we need to make sure that we've done our due diligence to try our best. And if we're unable to get something passed and through, then we should stop. And Maybe I, carve I out, just get. carve out. 
Okay, can, can we get a report on the four meetings that were held yes. on Molokai? Who attended them and what is the recommendation of each? Sure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, any other questions? See none. Uh, next up, SB 3006 relating to the Convention Center. Uh, first up, uh, Daniel Nahobi. Aloha. The Tourism Authority stands on its support for SB 3006. It's very important that as we continue to make our convention center uh, operational and sustainable, that there are other avenues for funding, particularly as it is a 20-year-old building, and additional expansion or adjustments to the needs of the market are very critical beyond just the current funding that's available. Mahalo. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, testifying for Unite Here Local 5 in opposition, uh, Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association in support. Anybody else wishing to testify on this measure? Seeing none, any questions? Uh, Senator Wakai. Daniel. If you were to get this bill passed, give me a ballpark figure. How much money do you plan to bring in through naming rights? So, um, as you mentioned in our testimony, AS, ASM Global did a study in the first year, it's about 400 to 500,000. Over a 20 year agreement value, it's about 13 million uh, and equates to about 44.6 million in impressions. Is there and we have a full study that was posted at our January board meeting. Is there an expectation that, let's say, some corporation comes forward that you're gonna put a sign on the convention center? So part of the request is having the opportunity to put a sign in the convention center, on the convention center on the outside. Yes, and that's part of the request in the bill. Okay, so you're willing to go against the outdoor circle and those who are gonna testify in opposition to the next bill. Shouldn't, wouldn't it be prudent for us to put your language into that other bill that's providing for billboard exemption? Yes, we would. We are agreeable to uh, adding our name as well as the, to the stadium authorities bill that they are putting in right now. Okay, good. So you're going to support that bill too? Yes. Okay. Got it. Question. Senator Kim. Okay, so it says on the convention center, in or on the convention center. So does that limit you to one sign or does that allow you to plaster the entire convention center with signs? Well, we were looking for the options, but most likely we would do what's most prudent typically for uh, naming of a building would be the one main sign. But you're not limited by this. This allows you to put as many and whatever size you want on that building. I'm sure we'll be following. Um, yeah, but there's limited. no guarantee, right? There's no guarantee. There's no guarantee you're going to be there and you're we're here today. So I find that this is broad. And do you have people in your staff that is doing the advertising um, solicitation? Currently, this is, um, it would be come under the ASM global contract. What is the ASM global contract? Uh, the operators and management of the convention center. Is that the one that is doing the conventions? Currently, right now, yes. So they're going to do the advertising? Seeking, so, um, advertising? seeking sales, right. For advertising? Yes. Is that part of their contract right now? No, we would then have to modify that contract. Yeah, but what if we null and void that contract altogether? Then, of course, it's our responsibility, and we would do that. Work and you have the expertise to do that. And then we would ask for requests uh, for additional positions at that point. So we're allowed, the bill allows us to have that opportunity to work towards those goals. OK, thank you. Uh, just one question, Daniel. Yes. So, so what if the entity that wants naming rights has no connection to Hawaii? Would that mean the convention center could be attached to a name with no connection to Hawaii as well? No, definitely in the development of the procedures and uh, we laid out in that study, there will be criteria uh, developed by Hawaii Tourism Authority. And of course, I'm sure we will have community input into that um, procedures and policies. But same thing, no guarantee of a mainland a company comes in that say it drops $10 million to put their name up there, that you guys would say, no, we just going to stick with 
Hawaii. Well, the guarantee will be written into the policies that we put for evaluation of, and selection of um, companies that would be buying okay. those rights. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, Senate Bill 3197 relating to advertising. Uh, first up, Ryan Andrews, Stadium Authority. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Ryan Andrews. I'm with the Stadium Authority, and we are appreciative of all ideas and strategies that support the new Aloha Stadium Entertainment District. And as such, we support the intent of this bill. I will start by saying we aren't numb to the comments of those who oppose easing restrictions on outdoor signage, detracting from the beauty of our home, and we agree that there should be restrictions. However, if there is a place to create an exception, we believe it's an entertainment district with a stadium such as the one that we'll be building. I think it would be good for me to paint a picture of what we are envisioning and perhaps dispel some of the, the fiction that's out there. First, we are not trying to establish a Times Square or a Las Vegas atmosphere within the new Hello Stadium Entertainment District. What we are envisioning, and I should also say we're not envisioning large billboards facing outwards into the neighborhood. What we are envisioning are really three key things. One is the ability to put naming rights on the building, such as you just heard from the convention center. Two is the ability to use digital signs and wallscapes on the stadium exterior and other buildings in the district where people gather, such as outdoor plazas or entry gates into the stadium where hype videos and sponsor <coughs> messages and other fan engagements can be shown. And third, we're seeking to use digital kiosks within the district, such as you would find at a shopping mall where they can be used for wayfinding, they can be used for advertising products and services of businesses in the district, as well as other messaging related to events. We are envisioning that NACED will be a dynamic and engaging district, and we want digital signage to enhance the experience for those that are in the district. We do believe this can be done in a very thoughtful way in collaboration with the community to ensure that the signage maintains visual aesthetics and that we minimize any negative impacts such as light pollution. Of course, I would be remiss if I did not mention another benefit of the signage, which is revenue generation. Our market studies looking at revenue opportunities in this area, including um, digital assets in the district, found that an integrated digital signage program could generate up to two and a half million a year or 75 million over the 30 year operating period. And although additional revenue is important to the success of this project, the use of digital signage really goes beyond revenue and is about creating a brand for the district and really an engaging and an immersive experience for those visiting the district. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Uh, next up, Craig Nakamoto on Zoom in support testifying for HCD. Not present on Zoom, Chair. Okay, uh, thank you. Next up, Winston Welch. Testifying for Outdoor Circle on Zoom. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair DeCoyd and Vice Chair Wapai and other committee members. Uh, mahalo, mahalo for the opportunity to testify today. And we do stand on our written testimony opposing the weakening of our billboard laws. We do share this feeling overwhelmingly with Hawaii residents. Um, in the testimony that you have before you today, I counted at least 88 individual testifiers opposing the Senate Bill um, 3197. Four testified in favor, the Masons Union, HCDA, the Stadium Authority, and the Chamber of Commerce, but no individuals testified in favor of this. Why? Because words that were used in testimony were visual pollution, uh, horrified, visual blight, eyesore, uh, disgusted, unnatural, desecrate, aghast, hideous, shocked that this would be considered, uh, distracting, visual clutter, um, cheapens, degrades, mars the beauty, sets precedent. All of these words, um, of course, are conveying very strong feelings why people are against this. We have a hundred year unique history in these islands. We are not the mainland. Uh, this is exactly and only designed for developers. Um, as our friend just testified about strengthening the brand, well, the brand of Hawaii is no billboards. That is our brand. So uh, you know, we have an opportunity to continue what your predecessors have done they enacted this ban 100 years ago uh, for critically important reasons. So following their wisdom and all of those who have uh, preceded you uh, is what really visitors and locals alike uh, would like. Uh, they want to keep Hawaii Hawaii. 
a much more comfortable place to live. Um, you know, instead of, uh, you know, we want to escape the visual noise, not, not create more of it. The local stadium did not need uh, billboards. There are other great tech options out there um, that we can employ for certain things. If there's, if the uh, stadium authority wanted to put billboards um, inside of the stadium uh, for, for whatever reason, that's fine. As long as they're not vis uh, visible from the roadside. Thank you. Your time is up. We have your testimony. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, I actually have, bless you, several uh, others in support and then opposition. Oh, here we go. Bruce Lum in opposition on Zoom. Not present on Zoom, Chair. Jo Joanne Malt. Also in opposition on Zoom. Not present on Zoom, Chair. Okay. Um, I don't have anybody else uh, aside from a lot of uh, testimony in opposition. Anybody else wishing to testify on this measure? Oh, David, go ahead, Dean. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, <clears throat> Deputy Director Dan Wicker, DBED. Um, uh, Stadium Authority is an attached agency, and we had a discussion on this bill. Um, DBED supports the intent. We have to look at ways to generate revenue to control um, to pay for operations and maintenance. We did do site visits during the interim to new stadium development districts. I think billboarding might be an adequate term. What we saw at, at some of these stadiums in these entertainment districts was at grade or within the walls or on the exterior at grade advertisements. And you do see that here presently. You got baggage claim at Honolulu International Airport with digital advertisement boards, as well as some of the commercial parking structures with the wall advertisement. So asking for your consideration and support. Thank you. Thank you. You want it? Did you want to? Um, I think you. Thank you. Again, the Hawaii Tourism Authority supports the um, this bill as it's very similar to our request for naming rights and the ability to generate the revenue that's required for maintenance of the buildings. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to testify on the measure? Seeing none, any questions from the committee? Senator Wakai. Uh, Ryan. So Mr. Andrews, I mean, this weekend is a Super Bowl played at Allegiant Field. Allegiant Airlines pays $20 million a year for that privilege for 20 years. So the developers of Allegiant Field are making $400 million off of naming rights. Hawaii obviously is a much smaller market, maybe not as glamorous activities and events as a Super Bowl. But I mean, if I do my calculations on the numbers you gave us, $2.5 million per year over a 30 years lifespan of which um, the developer will be responsible, that's $75 million that we're looking at that, that could be uh, gotten here if we go down this road. The legislature gave you $350 million to build a stadium. Correct me if I'm wrong, at that level, we might build a 25,000 seat bench seat stadium with no amenities and no roof. So to be actually half the size of the current stadium with no roof, that's what's going to, what we're gonna get if we don't bring in other sources of revenue. You are correct, Senator. The $350 million does get us a very basic stadium of about 25,000 people, no roof, and a lot of bench seating. Um, so yeah, any revenue stream that can help this is, is important. And we are asking the developers to put a lot of money into this project <coughs> along with the money that we have from the state. And so any opportunity for them to get that money back would be very beneficial. And help me understand the timing of this. You went out to RFP in December. I think you're going to get the reason some uh, feedback in later this month um, and then ultimately are going to dwindle, dwindle it down to a final group and then by this fall you're going to pick the lucky uh, contractor that's going to build up the entire stadium district. How would this fit in with that trajectory? I mean some have said like ah, do it later on. Isn't it important for us to get this done now so as everyone pencils in their financials on what the stadium might be envisioned like that they can take this into account and give us as a public a better, more uh, amenity full filled stadium. Yeah, the, the timing is interesting because you're correct. We're gonna get, we're in the qualifications phase right now. 
And so we should be shortlisting down to, let's say two or three um, developers by middle of April. So they'll be in a proposal phase starting in May through the summer. And it's in that proposal phase where they're gonna put forward ideas such as this for us to evaluate. So knowing what is allowed and what's not allowed is actually very important for them. Um, not only from a programmatic standpoint to create that energizing district, but also from a revenue standpoint, so they know how much they might be able to get back and actually use to invest in the stadium. You mentioned about the community concerns that we're not going to create Times Square and Las Vegas, particularly for the neighboring areas of Makalapa and uh, Aiea. Uh, and this bill right now is pretty loose. And I know that you and um, even Daniel, before you on the previous bill, talked about, oh, we're going to use administrative rules and what have you to constrain this. But for the assurance of, of the public, can we, as this bill moves, or if this bill moves on, put in some level of language to assure the people of IAEA, Makalapa, and such that uh, they are not going to be flooded with a whole bunch of lights in their face at, at midnight or 24 hours of the day? No, I think that's a great idea. And as I testified, we're not asking for a blanket to do anything we want. We think restrictions are reasonable. And as I mentioned, the three priorities that I envision are inside the stadium district. So they don't have to face out to the community. So I think I heard, I don't know the gentleman that testified against billboards. We're not looking at billboards plastering the community. We're looking at doing very strategic messaging, communications, advertising within the district boundaries itself, facing inward. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Kim. So can you tell us what are those boundaries are for the stadium district? It's our TMK property lines. Which is? 98 acres. No, you know that's not what I'm asking. I want to know what the boundaries are so the people that live around there. Oh, gotcha. There... I'm sorry. I wasn't following your questioning. Um, well, on the south side, it would be Salt Lake Boulevard and Cam Highway. And on the north side, it would be H201. Okay, so it doesn't extend beyond if you folks get anything in the stadium, that food land area where they had sack and save and that's closed down and possibly using that as a staging for selling the, the sponsorships like they did at, um, in San Diego where we had that, what is it called? Vision, vision, imaging, imagine, imaginary center or something like that. Not in that location, no. No. We'll be doing it within our own property lines. Okay, so you're not gonna extend that out. So um, DBED, can I have DBED come up? So Dave. Yeah, so Dave, you've said that all of this would be at grade. So, when you look at the when you look at the stadium when you're walking in, it would be at pedestrian level. Some of the signage up on top, like naming rights, but I'm not. We're listening to some of the testimony. I think there's been fear instilled that we're talking about billboards on posts up in the air, skyrise. No, that's okay, not my understanding. So can of that. we put something in this bill to assure that it's going to be at grade and any digital signs are going to be within the stadium itself and not outside where it would distract drivers driving and looking at um, you know, what's the new message or what's the new digital or whatever, like they do at Allegiance. Um, so can we put some of that language in here and that anything outside be limited to the naming rights? That's beyond, that's beyond my, also I'm not the marketing. No, um, you're not, but you're yeah. saying that it should be at grade and it should, you know, it should adhere to some of the stuff. That's so, what that's what I saw when I went on some of these yeah. these site visits. So, so yes. to assure the general public out there about that it's not billboards, that we put restrictions similar for the convention center, that we put these restrictions on there so that we're sure that it's not going to um, be a slippery slope and extend elsewhere. Safeguards are I would say yes to safeguards. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. I don't know if DBED would be the, um, the appropriate responder, perhaps the stadium authority, because if what you're talking about is digital imagery, you know, images that would be facing inwards, you know, to the, uh, I guess, stadium 
entertainment district itself, then why is it necessary to be exempt from the um, billboard law? What I'm suggesting is not just digital imaging in the stadium, but on the exterior of the stadium. So if you can imagine you go to a stadium and you buy your tickets, there could be video boards with engaging material about the game you're going to see or the concert you're going to see. There could also be messaging there from sponsors of that event, for instance. So it's not just in the stadium, but it's outside in the plazas where people gather. Okay, and so is this going to be like 24-7 or is it during limited times during which people are arriving at that facility or, you know, it, it seems like such a broad exemption where if, you know, you are really looking to engage the surrounding community as well as participants, it would seem that targeted messaging as well as, you know, social media and all of those other forms of advertising would ultimately be your strongest means of enhancing public engagement as well as um, you know the marketing and advertising benefits. You know, I'll give you an example of something that I think was exciting. So a few years ago, the Milwaukee Bucks were the NBA championships and they had a full arena. And outside the arena, they had a video board, which I don't know how big, but fairly, fairly large. They had more people watching the event from outside than from inside. So I, so I look at that as an engaging, engaging activity for this district. This is an entertainment district we're developing, so it's, I feel like it's unique. Okay, well, that, that actually is more alarming, but yes. okay, thank you for the information. Kim. So at Neil Blaisdell, they have an electronic board that faces the main corridor, and people stop or slow down and read it, which causes a lot of traffic. Is that what's going to happen over here? No, because again, what I'm suggesting is that it's seen within the district, not from the outside, as we were talking before on the roadways. Okay, so if you have the corner of Salt Lake Boulevard and um, Cam Highway, and you're on the corner and your sign is facing towards, towards the stadium, it could still be read. It could still be read by people driving and then rubbernecking to see what it says, right? You know, until we know what's going to be built in that district, it's hard to say how that's Well, going that's to what our concern yeah. is. We don't want to wait. I don't want to wait until you see it, and then it's too late because we gave you the exception, and you've already sold the rights, and you already got the money coming in. That's too late. So we, I would be more comfortable with a lot of restrictions in here to guarantee that we're not going to have that where you get around it by saying, well, it's within our district. It's on the, it's on the fence facing inward can't be helped if they can read it from coming down Salt Lake Boulevard, right? Understood. I, I understand where you're coming from. Okay, yeah. thank you. Senator Fowler. So just, I, I, know, I know it's not going to be Vegas with smoking hamburgers and half-naked women. Um, <laughs> you, you know, for me, um, I, I, like, I like about having advertisement. What my colleagues is saying is that you want to advertise, and what you had answered to us, um, my senators is that was alarming is that you have a bunch of people, uh, not in a stadium or not in an area watching what's in the stadium. How, how productive is that? So, my, my thing is going going forward is that I understand the one you're talking about because you know we have that fancy little TVs about a snack bar in a stadium now. But if you're going to have those kinds of things in, within the stadium, then, then I, I, I know more probably, if you're going to have a billboard, I mean, I, I really, when I was young, I really thought the Blaisdell one was a state of the art. So I don't mean about traffic. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I mean, Chuck, Chuck, Chuck Wagon was even better. But anyway, um, <laughs> the thing is, we don't want, we don't want anything that would impair the drivers. That's what she's saying. And we want to make it sure if this, and, and right now it's very new, to all of us, and we cannot, I mean, we cannot say yay or nay, but we need to have one, one, one plan, you know, always like Milwaukee, Senator Morak always say, we need one plan, because if we give the approval, and then the plan is not in taste of the area, I mean, I know you're saying it's the whatever district, but still yet, we have people that are still driving by, and should be within the, the, the district, and should have taste in a sense of, I understand, you know, the revenue that we can get from advertising on there like that, because when I went to Japan, I never seen one flat screen TV that big and they advertised Sony, Toshiba, you know, and it was awesome. 
So that's what I think the concern is. I mean, I like having something to advertise and whatnot, but we got to make sure that we have safety and, and parameters. So that's something that I think, you know, we need to check into. But thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, recess for decision making. Thank you. Uh, decision making on our 101 p.m. agenda. The first bill up is Senate Bill 3194. Uh, my recommendation is to pass as an SD1 in Section B, changing the date to December 31st, 2025. So the section will read under B, no later than December 31st, 2025, the Public Utilities Commission shall establish by rule or order policies and procedures to investigate retail wheeling, including any appropriate rate to charge the renewable electricity project developer, independent renewable energy generator, or user of renewable energy for retail wheeling. Also making technical amendments needed for consistency and clarity and if defecting the date to January 1st, 2060. Uh, any discussion? Uh, seeing none, uh, for, uh, Vice Chair Wakai for the vote. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes yes. Senator Fukunaga. Aye. Senator Kim. Aye. Senator Favela. Reservation. Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Senate Bill 3043. Uh, recommendation. Recommendation is to pass as an SD1 and making technical amendments needed for consistency and clarity. Any discussion, members? Seeing none, Vice Chair Kai for the vote. Chair votes aye. Noting the presence of all members, any opposition or reservations to the chair's recommendation, we pass this measure with amendments. You see, we heard none, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Next up, Senate Bill 3010. Uh, my, my recommendation is to pass as an SD1, making technical amendments needed for consistency and clarity. Committee members, any discussion? Seeing none, uh, Vice Chair for the vote. Chair votes aye. Noting the presence of all EET members, any opposition or reservations to the Chair's recommendation, we pass this measure with amendments. We've seen and heard none, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Next up is Senate Bill 3282. Our recommendation is to pass as an SD1, changing any reference of energy office to energy division and making technical amendments needed for consistency and clarity. Committee members, in discussion. Thank you. Anybody else? Seeing none, uh, Chair, uh, Vice Chair Kai for the vote. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes yes. Senator Fukunaga. Reservations. Senator Kim. Aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Chair, your recommendations adopted. Thank you. <coughs> Next bill up, Senate Bill 3364, destina relating to destination management. My recommendation is to, uh, is to pass as an SD1. Um, provided uh, that HTA gives, gives us and provides the committee with a comparison of the ending of the contract, as well as of the hiring of the people in the contract with, uh, with, the, with the comparison of an overlap in regards to DMAP and adding uh, to the committee report. That's just added in the committee report. Added in the committee report. Yeah. Um, and other technical amendments. Committee members, any discussion? Just to clarify, so the SD1 will defect the date and the language about the comparison and the numbers would be just requ requested, requested in the committee report or mentioned in the committee Yes. Report. Yes, thank you. Yes. Any other discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, uh, Vice Chair Wakai for the vote. Chair votes aye. 
Noting the presence of all members, any opposition or reservations to the chair's recommendation, we pass this measure with amendments. And seeing you heard, Chair, recommendations adopted. Thank you. Uh, next up, Senate Bill 3006. Senate Bill 3006. I'm going to defer, defer this bill for decision making <coughs> to next week, Thursday, next week, Tuesday, February 13th at 1 p.m. Uh, Senate Bill 3197, linked to advertising, also <coughs> will defer this bill uh, to February 13 at 1 p.m. in this room for decision making. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Mm -hmm.